answering your top IVF questions. Hi friends and welcome back to the YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And this channel exists to help educate you about your body, your fertility, treatments that you're doing, and just so you're overall a better advocate for yourself on this journey. Today, I am answering your top IVF questions and these questions all came from the community tab. So subscribe to the channel and then follow along and I will post questions in the community tab before we do our next Q&A video and I'm targeting them all by type. So we'll do endometriosis and ovulation induction and PCOS and all of that. All right, so we are going to dive in and answer your questions. What are the successful chances of pregnancy on the first transfer? I am 29 years old, my husband is 30, and we were diagnosed with unexplained infertility after trying to conceive for two years. We've had three failed IUIs and we will be starting IVF with ICSI in March. All right, Victoria, well, I know it is so hard to be young and to have unexplained infertility. That is one of my least favorite diagnoses because everybody will say, oh, you're young, it'll happen. And because as humans, we just love answers. Remember that unexplained doesn't mean that nothing's wrong. It just means none of the top or easy things to test are wrong. In general, in your age range, you'll have a really good chance of success with IVF. Now, what does this really mean when it comes to success? The easiest way to categorize IVF success is the chance of a live birth, holding a baby in your arms, with an embryo transfer. So if you have one genetically untested embryo, which in your age range you could do either, your chance of success would be a 45 to 50% chance of live birth, so pretty good. If you do genetic testing on the embryos, you would have about a 65 to 70% chance of live birth, so slightly better. Now, both options are appropriate. I sometimes like genetic testing if you know you want a lot of kids and you want to decrease the chance of miscarriage, but ultimately at age 29, I would support either option. So you can say, this is the mindset reframe I often do. You didn't want to do IVF. You were hoping you'd get there easier, but here you are. So at least you're doing the gold standard, the best treatment for unexplained infertility. It targets so many different things that could be going on and you have an overall great chance of success. Wrap it in your brain that you might need two embryo transfers in either scenario and that is okay and it doesn't mean that something is wrong. Thought of another one. After a couple of PGT tested embryos don't stick in transfers, what would the next type of test that you do? This is a good question that brings up a couple different points. The first one is, as I just said, so PGT is pre-implantation genetic testing. That is genetic screening of embryos. A genetically normal embryo has on overall a 65% chance of live birth. When we looked at people who did the exact same protocol, so a controlled or a pretty traditional protocol where we give people estrogen and progesterone, after the first transfer, 65% went on to have success. After the second, it was 88% of people. And after the third, it was 95% of people. So that means that implantation failure is more rare than we thought it was, right? So only 5% of people would fail to have a normal embryo implant after the third one. And there were no extra tests and there were no protocol changes in this study. So I think that this is underlying the point that not every embryo, even if it's genetically normal, has the right capacity or capability or the competency to become a living human. Cells have to divide and organs have to form and there's so many steps from embryo to becoming a baby. So I just want you to realize that our internal norm is to go and blame ourselves. It must be my uterus or my body or the environment, but it's probably just the embryo, even though it's genetically normal. That's like tier one, but there's still so much else it has to do. That being said, back to the question, what do we do? I mean, ultimately it is gonna depend on how many embryos total you have and your medical history. Sometimes we consider doing an ERA test, which is an endometrial receptivity analysis test. This is a test where you do essentially a mock transfer cycle, but instead of putting an embryo inside, you get a sample of the endometrium and you try to determine if somebody needs more or less progesterone. The test was developed for recurrent miscarriage or implantation failure. It has been studied and shown to not be appropriate before your first or even one failed transfer. And that is because it's probably not a test that really is appropriate for everybody. 
Other things you sometimes consider doing is making sure that you've evaluated the uterine cavity and the fallopian tubes, making sure that you've checked for a thyroid disease or checked for any type of clotting disorder or things that could fall under the recurrent pregnancy loss pathway, which we sometimes consider if somebody's having recurrent implantation failure. I always also talk about lifestyle factors, decreasing inflammation. Is there any underlying autoimmune disease or any modifications we can make in our life? And then the next thing is to consider a different transfer protocol. So should we consider a natural or a modified natural cycle if we've been doing a controlled or vice versa? Should we consider a controlled cycle with Lupron? Are we concerned there's endometriosis? Should we do a long Lupron suppression? So there are a little different options. And if you've failed a couple embryo transfers, I always recommend a WTF appointment with your doctor. Sit down, go through it, ask your questions and understand the game plan and their rationale for what they wanna do next. All right, and then the next question, can a single frozen embryo split after transfer? Does the number of days old it is matter or have a factor? All right, so the answer here is yes. You do have a higher risk of identical twinning, one embryo splitting into two, after you put the embryo inside the body, then you see in nature. So risk of identical twinning with IVF is about two to 3%. So low, but not zero. We do more than hundred transfers a year. And the risk of identical twinning in nature and natural conception is less than half a percent. So a significant difference. We do see identical twinning more with blastocyst or day five, six embryo transfers than day three. And probably, or the hypothesis is that the embryo is bigger and more expanded and that having that embryo, you know, touch the walls of the catheter or be manipulated in the process might predispose it to have an increased tendency to split. This is another reason why the recommendations have changed over time and we are putting fewer embryos in people. I know patients are often asking, can we do two? I want to have twins and be done with this. But transferring two embryos carries substantial risk both to mom and to baby, but also you then have the risk of triplets and quads, which have much lower survivability rates. So we really wanna to try to stick with one embryo if it's genetically tested, or if we have good prognosis patients, just to try to get the highest live birth rate per embryo. After an egg retrieval, what can be some causes on why mature eggs don't fertilize? Is there anything you can do before your IVF cycle that can help? So in IVF, there's two different types of fertilization. There's conventional fertilization, and this is what we did when IVF was first created. So you have your petri dish and your eggs and you just squirt sperm over it and cover it and put it in the incubator and then the other one we have ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection and with ICSI what is happening is one sperm is being selected and put into a little catheter or pipette and you hold your egg study and you actually put that sperm into the egg for ICSI a lot of fertilization actually depends on the egg if it wants to accept the sperm or not because the sperm is being placed there and in conventional fertilization it's really dependent on both egg and sperm not every mature egg fertilizes even when you do ICSI we typically tell people that the average rate of fertilization is about 75 to 80 percent so we know that not every egg is going to accept fertilization now what can you do about it Probably some of this is due to genetically abnormal eggs or eggs that aren't good quality and don't have what they need to develop into a baby. So ultimately, as a person, you can try to just improve egg and sperm quality to the best of your ability. This would include decreasing inflammation, talking to your team about fertility supplements, looking at your diet, trying to eat really clean and non-processed food, getting sleep. Of course, sleep is when our body heals and takes care of inflammation, trying to be at a healthy weight, exercise, and overall making sure we're taking care of our other medical conditions and avoiding toxins like marijuana is a huge one that we're seeing right now. So you can do those things and that's pretty much all you can do. There might be some things within the protocol, some eggs and some patients do better on one protocol than another. And so you might wanna see if your doctor wants to switch that up or at least ask them. And if you have a really low fertilization rate, I wanna say, did you do conventional? Should you do ICSI the next time? Those would be good questions to ask your team. Okay, starting an IVF cycle with birth control or doing a natural start with DOR. So DOR is diminished ovarian reserve. There's really both options can be appropriate and I've done both. A lot of times I like birth control because I do feel like a short course of birth control pills which stop the brain from sending out FSH. Again, FSH is the medication we use to grow eggs. So if we have a short course of birth control pills first, then this can often help kind of synchronize and get all of those eggs together. 
When you have low ovarian reserve, the body really wants to ovulate that one egg and your FSH becomes really high quite early in the cycle. So you really do need to usually start birth control pretty early on your period if you're going to use it. That being said, birth control pills don't always suppress everybody or some people it over suppresses them. So there is a variable difference and sometimes a natural cycle can be better. A natural start is just when you call, when you're on your period and you come in, you get a baseline ultrasound and then you start your FSH medications. Either are fine. I would talk to your team about why they choose one or the other. Birth control does allow a little bit more planning for your schedule, so that is nice. But again, I also have patients who can't take birth control because they have history of a blood clot, migraines with aura, history of cancer, a variety of different things. So sometimes we are doing natural or spontaneous starts because it is the safest and best option. Who are good candidates for IVF? When is it better to skip IUI and go to IVF? I've heard PCOS patients are good candidates since we often have lots of eggs. In general, let's just think about a few things. Number one, people who we know need IVF is if we have tubal disease or tubal factor or severe male factor infertility or any genetic diseases that we want to screen out, like carriers for a certain genetic disease. And when you're older, specifically if you have unexplained infertility, we know that going through IVF gets you pregnant faster and saves you money. So there was a study done that looked at people who were 38 and older with unexplained. One group did IUIs and then IVF, and the other group went straight to IVF. And because the rate of success with IUI is overall pretty low, with unexplained infertility, it's at best eight to 10% per cycle. The group that just did IVF first had higher success rates faster and spent less money. And that's because this other group went through these IUI cycles with only eight to 10% of people being pregnant each month. So the majority did IUIs and then ended up going on to IVF. For unexplained infertility in general, IVF is always going to be the gold standard because it's treating so many of the different factors versus IUI, which is just trying to improve the odds. PCOS patients are great candidates for IVF, and that is because they do have a lot of eggs. And sometimes we have to go to IVF and PCOS because we can't induce ovulation in a safe way. Medications that we use for ovulation induction, we're really targeting one or two eggs to grow. And I have PCOS patients who will either have no response or they'll grow like eight eggs and we don't need any reality TV shows. So if you are a PCOS and you're refractory or we just can't target that perfect number of eggs for ovulation induction, moving on to IVF can be the safest and best option for you. Overall, there's no clear answer here. And so I think this is a nuanced discussion about your age, how many kids you want, what your ovarian reserve is, and your diagnosis for infertility. You should get personalized success rates for both and have your doctor walk you through what the odds are and what makes the most sense. But yes, this is kind of a complicated thing because IUI is overall simpler and cheaper and IVF is more complicated and more expensive, but much more successful. I hope you guys enjoyed answering some of these questions. We will do this again. I do have a whole IVF playlist, videos explaining IVF step-by-step -step and breaking down commonly asked questions. So feel free to check those out. I also do have the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course talking about a lot of the lifestyle factors. And there's a new IVF guide component that if you're doing IVF really breaks down a ton. So those links are in the show notes. As always, I appreciate you being here. You can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or check out the As A Woman podcast for more fertility related information. Thanks friends.